Five, Jillian, yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I don't imagine this is going to take very long. I don't have uh, a tome of material prepared, but more about just trying to have a discussion with everybody in the room. Uh, but I will also, as those of you who know me, I'll blather on as long as you let me. Uh, so you should interrupt with questions or whatever it is that you want to do, we can we go with it. Um, so really the topic is obviously it's about social media use and whether I find it personally valuable as a scientist. Uh, and so I started using social media in 2010 essentially. And what I mean by social media, I'm mainly talking about the tools of either blogging to your own website and also through using Twitter. And so as someone who's been kind of interested in these technologies and means of communicating really from the very beginning of my academic career, um, it comes up in topic you know, conversations from time to time. And so the opinions you get about your use of Twitter or use of blogging, uh, there's a strong generational effect. Um, but I get all kinds of things like this from people. So, you know, social media is something that kids do, uh, or as if it's some kind of a trivial thing. And so, like, I'm 43 years old, like, they didn't have, it's, I'm starting to get to an age where I can start talking about things they didn't have when I was in college. They didn't have Facebook when I was in college. They had Google had just kind of got started. Um, so we didn't have kind of these tools. But certainly they've been an important part of kind of, uh, academic discourse really for the most of my career kind of post PhD um, it's a waste of time and that's what I'll talk about today uh, the things that people do on social media are stupid or trivial and it's kind of a, a silly argument as well because these are tools that essentially you do what you want to do with them so if you want to do silly or trivial things on social media then you do that uh, so that doesn't have a lot of water but it's an opinion I've heard over and over again uh, social media will be the end of civilization as we know it uh, there's no shortage of people that have a very alarmist approach to the idea that people are using the internet to talk to one another. Uh, I don't know why it's quite so shocking, uh, but anyway, it's out there. Um, and these last two, I think, are worth noting. So the one thing, again, comes back, nobody wants to know what I ate for lunch. So a lot of people will say, oh, you like to use Twitter as a scientist. Like, well, nobody, you know, like, nobody cares what I think. Right? Nobody cares what I'm doing. And one, I don't tell people what I ate for lunch. Uh, you know, so again, you can choose. Uh, but number two, I think most people, if you're going to be a scientist, you have developed expertise and opinions that are worth sharing. And that using social media in some respect is a good way to practice valuing that part of yourself. To practice sharing what you know with people. And we'll come back and touch on some of this. And then the last one, as a kind of disclaimer, is there are tons of people, successful academics, that don't use social media at all. I'd certainly say that most successful academics have never used social media. And so if we look at the School of Public Health and the more senior people in our department, um, they're terrible at social media. I can tell you every single one of them on Twitter is terrible at Twitter. And it hasn't stopped them in any way whatsoever. I don't mean they're terrible. You know what I'm saying, right? They're just, they're just not good at Twitter. And so it's, it clearly hasn't gotten in the way of anybody. Uh, progressing along their careers. I'm certainly not saying that these are tools that people should or need to use. So the point though is essentially just to give my opinion on where I see value in these tools from my perspective as a scientist. So I'm not a marketer. I don't particularly care about UCC's uh, outward facing self in terms of this talk. I'm just trying to think about things uh, in my own experiences where I find value in these tools for my career, for me as a scientist, very self-focused, very selfishly. Why do I continue to get on Twitter and write blog posts even though HR could care less, and nor should they necessarily, uh, even though I don't see any kind of real tangible, obvious uh, points in my career where this happened or that happened because I was doing these things, why do I continue to do this? And so an economist would say, clearly I have some kind of a value for it because uh, I keep pursuing. So just to kind of, as just as an offshoot overview, um, really just, I mean, does anybody else here have a blog, a personal web page? How, yeah, sorry, and your blog, what do you talk about on your blog, if you, if I, you don't mind me asking? Oh, I'm from Washington, D.C., so okay. I talk about what it's like to live in Ireland. Okay, fair enough. Travel blog, that's a very important topic. Uh, obviously, I've traveled a bit myself, and so I like to read what other people's experiences are. Um, anybody else? Did I catch anybody else? So just one blogger in the room. Okay, two bloggers in the room. What do you blog about, Helen? Um, I have two. You have two blogs. Um, well, you should give the talk. Um, so I'm uh, 
uh, Hans Moyes from Computer Science, work at the Insight Center. Uh, so uh, I have one which is uh, uh, relatively old on applications of constraint programming to the area that I'm working on, industrial applications, basically presenting stuff that I did with industry. And the other is relatively new, uh, it's on wait lists for outpatients in Irish hospitals. Hmm. Um, part of a project, or outcome of a project we did with an industrial partner. Um, something that's difficult to publish, but that's important for, I think, uh, Ireland as, as a country and uh, as a society. That's right, that's a good example. We'll talk, we'll come back to that in just a second, this idea of where we can put things. Because uh, we have a very constrained kind of set of venues in front of us. Um, I use my blog, I got very interested in it because uh, not so much as a promotional thing, but it was very clear kind of, you know, you know, in the mid-2000s that the internet was going to change how we do science. That in terms of how we publish, you know, we don't have to put anything on paper anymore. I mean, we still have ethics committees wanting to talk about storage data as if there's like some kind of a limit, you know, to, to paper in some respects. Like, everything in terms of how we publish and share is changing because of the internet. So that was one of the things I like to blog about. And over time, um, you know, you just start to pick up kind of different topics and areas. So I talk a lot, I do a lot of bit of tutorials uh, on how to do particular analyses, how to do particular tasks in data analysis. Uh, a fair bit of commentary if I read an editorial that I have an opinion on, I might write something about that. Uh, things of that nature. So a blog, you know, for those who aren't familiar with it, it literally is anything you want to do. Anything that you've got in your head that you want to get out and you want to share, like that's blogging. That's all that is. And that's not you know, that's not rocket science. Twitter, how many Twitter users? So a good number of those. And how many people have been using Twitter, say, for like more than two or three years? Yeah, okay, so we have quite a few people on Twitter. So you'll bear with me here. So for people who aren't very familiar with Twitter, Twitter gets called a microblogging tool. Because the idea is that you send out these little short messages. Um, but really what gets lost in that kind of an idea is it's really, it, it is... Uh, a very social tool. It is a social network, uh, but not like the one at Facebook where your uncle shows up and says all kinds of ridiculous, horrifying things uh, and you have to kind of head your head in shame from the rest of your friends. Twitter is a social network that tends to be uh, populated by people within your field. Those are the people you choose to be engaged with. And so the way Twitter essentially works is you get a profile and you choose to follow people. And so you'll follow people that share interests with you, who say things you find interesting, whatever. And then once you follow the person, the little messages that they shoot out show up in your feed. And so as the time goes on over the day, messages appear and you read them or don't read them or whatever. At the same time, people are choosing to follow you. Right? So you have the people you're following, you have your followers. Anybody who's used Twitter at all understands how this works. Um, so the point here is to kind of highlight some of the reasons uh, where, where we find value in this. Uh, and of course, Twitter will also tell you when other people are kind of saying things to you and highlight certain things, da 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 da. Um, so again, questions, feel free, whatever. So I'll talk about risks at first, risks for individuals, uh, because they're there. I, I'm gonna, of course, I think it's overall beneficial, so I'm gonna do the risks first and kind of sweep those under the rug, and then I'll finish with the flourish about all the benefits. Uh, but the risks are not insignificant. And, of course, the biggest one, which is a part of people's overall critique of these things, is that it's a total waste of time. Now, what I'm trying to argue is that it's not a total waste of time, that there's a lot of value and there's a net benefit, but it is a waste of time. All right, so you can find yourself on Twitter in any number of reasons, uh, just kind of following on what's going on when you should be working on this manuscript, you should be reviewing these papers, you should be grading these, these, these reports. So it is something to keep in mind when you're starting to use social media like this um, that you need to find a fairly disciplined way to engage with it. And as I'll try to kind of emphasize later on, a big strength of Twitter is the social and aspect of it, the discussions that go on, the interaction that happens. And so one of the problems with that is it's because the conversations happen in real time, there's a tendency to want to pay attention to what's going on on Twitter once you're involved in these conversations. Because if you log off to go do something else, then the conversations move well beyond you and you come back to it. So there, you know, there's a way to kind of balance this out, I think, that bears some thought. So it's, just, it's worth saying that if you're going to get engaged in these things, 
Um, be disciplined about it. Find a way to have breaks. Find a way to turn it off. Like you should your email and all kinds of other things. Um, because I can tell you this, when you're involved in a conversation or you put something out there and people start clicking like and people start sharing it with other people, it's very gratifying to just sit there and watch your Twitter feed do these things and give you this feedback. As any psychologist, I think, would confirm that I think that's a pretty standard, uh, you know, understood way that people like this hedonic response of, you know, pats on the back and things like that. Um, so something to be aware of. Um, one of the biggest time sinks that you can easily eliminate uh, is this idea that there are trolls. And this is a word now that kind of gets used for bullying or abuse, all kinds of things. Um, when I was a graduate student, I got really interested in uh, the most trivial thing you could ever think of, which was sports message boards. So the idea that there were grown-ups who would get online message boards and talk about their favorite football or basketball team and argue about why your team from this place is rubbish and why my team from this place is the greatest thing ever. Just totally inane nonsense. And uh, I was really into this for whatever reason. And you learn very early on that there are people who just want to argue for the sake of argument. That's what trolling is. That's what real trolling is. This idea that there are people just out there pushing buttons just to get a response, just to get a rise. And it's really effective. And I know it's effective because this is, you know, that's almost 15 years ago and I still see the behavior online today and people's inability to not engage with it. So there's a whole class of people online in social media who their entire purpose in life, non-purpose in life, it's just to piss people off and get them to reply. And then once they've replied, oh, well, then I've got this person. I'm gonna, you know, so it's an easy way where you can get tied up in things on a network like Twitter that just don't, right? You just kind of understand up front. You don't respond to people who aren't engaging in good faith. You don't respond with people that you're not really having a discussion with. So some of the aspects of this where it can become a time sink, I think you can defend yourself against those if you just know or are aware. Now that leads into a whole other issue that I think presents a substantial risk for people, which is the actual topic of actual abuse. And the reality is this isn't something that I can speak to very directly. Um, I've really never had any instances where someone has given me a hard time online, anything that would approach abuse. Uh, I think I've been called a name or two over the course of say 10 or 12 years, but that's it. But we know from lots of experiences and stories that that is not everybody's experience or story. And so I think you do have to be aware um, that when you present yourself online in some kind of a public way, that you do run, there is going to be some kind of a risk for getting people's opinions. The closest that, that are very negative, abusive, uh, discriminatory, or what have you, um, the closest I ever came was I wrote a blog post essentially about normal probability distributions, but it was written in the context of uh, sex differences and different traits related, supposedly related to people's propensity to work in, in technical jobs. And so it was a topic that had, uh, you know, that involved a lot of people's very strong opinions. And it actually got picked up on this thing called Hacker News, uh, which is where people who work in tech talk about things that are on, you know, they see online. And even though there wasn't like any kind of abuse of anything for me, um, it was still kind of a very intense feeling that all of a sudden this isn't just my little blog post who three people are going to read and say something back to me on Twitter. This is, you know, a hundred strangers talking about this, picking it apart, criticizing it, agreeing, not agreeing, sometimes saying really stupid things, sometimes saying smart things. And so it came with a real response, I think, that's at least worth flagging up. And again, that's in a context where I don't, nobody's ever emailed me, nobody's ever given me a hard time. And we know that that isn't everybody's experience. Um, has anyone else dealt with anything like that online? I mean, I haven't dealt with it myself, but I was recently on a workshop where some other scientists showed their thing, and there's especially one who was working also in a field of vaccination and these kind of things. Yeah, okay. And so this is a highly controversial topic, and he wrote a blog post about it, and uh, like saying like some, uh, some of these things are pseudoscience and everything. And so one week later, he got a call from the vice president from his university that there's a petition with a few hundred signages from the U.S. Uh, calling for his, um, yeah, him being fired from the university right. because apparently he hit some some uh, society there in the U.S. against vaccination and they were very offended by it. And yes. 
That's uh, so I think, especially in the context of these controversial topics, sometimes you yeah, yeah, have to be have to be tough, and and sometimes these things happen that there's some society for whatever they think is is worth it, and yeah. But yeah. but like his best um, his best opinion was, especially when you're in these kind of things, to coordinate with your um, uh, your press office, with the university, for example because they are professionals in their field and so if even if you have a blog or so tell them about it and then they might be helpful and can, can give you tips and also have, have a broader presence as a university and say, oh, we, we, we are in accordance with this sure. scientist talking about it and then they can block off these kind of things. Yeah, no, it's fair enough. It's a good example. I mean, obviously, well, yeah. That's, uh, I mean, obviously, this, this probably is a very like rare example, but... Oh, but see, I, I don't, that, yeah. But you, but you have to be careful. I mean, sometimes they don't even think about it. And then, you know, there, right. was, there was another example about a guy who, who was on a, as a radio show every Wednesday, and he was talking about uh, predatory birds in a bad way. And all of a sudden, there's a, like, the first the Irish Society for Predators, then the UK one, and especially the Scottish one. Right. Apparently, it's very nasty. And just still today, he gets emails from one guy right. telling him, one day you find out where he's living and then see so, so like not funny like I'm <laughs> laughing but this is nervous yeah, laughter yeah, yeah. like I can't imagine you know how I'd feel about that there was actually someone tweeted very recently and I don't remember the person's name but they were essentially they had been blogging for quite some time about uh, some such kind of pop culture topic and that once upon a time uh, they had said something about how they liked being in hotels because they smell like chlorine and they make the person feel relaxed and apparently because of that blog post that there's still an ongoing conversation running in three threads which was one it was hotel employees writing in to say that it shouldn't smell like chlorine and that's really wrong and so people are still commenting on that and then there was something else about people also writing in that you know you might feel calm in a hotel but the people working there certainly don't feel calm in a hotel and so how dare you express this sentiment that you feel calm in a hotel when there's all these other people working so hard and all the rest of it and it is a good, another good example of, you know, kind of people will engage, and that's kind of part of the point. And so you kind of do need to be a bit prepared uh, for that engagement, uh, for sure, because it's, it's, it's going to happen on some level or another. Um, okay, so risk. Any other risks? Because so, a lot of people have used social media, at least Twitter. Is there anything else that, that stands out for people? Um, Hackers. Sorry? Hackers. Yeah, okay, so go with that, run with that, tell me more. I've never been hacked. Your account can be hacked. That's true. And they can share posts on your behalf, and obviously it's not you. And that can so that'd be a concern. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, I've never had that happen, thankfully. Nobody's out to hack <laughs> statisticians' Twitter accounts. <laughs> uh, might be part of the reasons. Uh, anything else? Anybody else want to chip anything in before I move in, Caroline? Uh, would there be any risk to like, your professional kind of your job? So I'm thinking of a... Two years ago, lady, she, she got on a flight, she went to Africa, she said, oh, yeah. inappropriate to go to Africa. Yeah, that was bad. She got there with viral, yes. she lost her job. Yeah. Think, you know that kind of, you are a Sure. It's like, it's I didn't get to my last one. Um, but yeah, that story was a really interesting one. So she was actually someone, I think, if memory serves, she was in PR. And so this is the story. Uh, she's getting on the plane, she's going to South Africa, and she tweeted before she got on the plane, I hope I don't get AIDS. Oh yeah, don't worry about it, I'm white. Okay, so there is a generous interpretation of that, which is that she is saying this in an offhand way to point out the, uh, the inequities in the world. Uh, there is a less generous way to put this, to, to interpret it, which is that uh, she's a racist and a moron. And none of us know the truth. I have an inkling of which one it probably is, uh, but it doesn't matter because she shouldn't have said it regardless and she got on the airplane just as like Caroline said and she flies and you know no air no no internet in the airplane and she lands in, in South Africa or wherever she was and uh, and her Twitter account is four million shares or whatever this thing has gone viral and I cannot imagine the feeling that she was dealing with uh, lost her job as a PR person not surprisingly um, and so I talked a little bit just a little bit of touch on tone um, I've never done anything like that. Uh, 
But you can find yourself, I can find my, <coughs> myself, I find myself sometimes when I do a lot of uh, arguing with people about things I think I know about, and you can start to find your tone slip a little bit to where maybe uh, I can see there are places where maybe I've been too combative or I've been too much of a know-it-all, uh, and that's not a good look, right? And so overall, you do have to think about how you're presenting yourself online, and things like Twitter, as I'll talk about, it starts to feel like a real community at some point, because it is one, and so it's very easy to kind of let your guard down at points, and sometimes that's good. It's good that we're all humans and that we all are the way we are, as long as, again, we're not being abusive or, or, or just completely idiotic. But at the same time, you never know how people are perceiving things about you, right? So you never know for sure. And so you do have to be kind of mindful of this. And we'll come back to it with, with talking about networking. Um, all right. So sorry. Oh, this ought to be challenging. I just accidentally, I think, wrote over the whole slide about benefits <laughs> in my rush to get over here after the, uh, the PhD things. Oh boy, this is going to be good. So anyway, that's fine. Um, okay, so let's talk about Twitter blogging kind of all together. What are the things I think that are beneficial about it? So the first thing, particularly with respect to blogging, is that if you're a scientist, you're a professional writer. And you might not realize that or not, but you are. Like your job, part of your job, an important part of your job, is to write up the science you do and communicate to other people. And for a lot of people, they don't get a lot of emphasis on writing and writing skills at any point in their training. Uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that should really come out through, through undergraduate training, but often doesn't. And so there's one advantage to blogging, which is that I think it's more practice writing, number one. And more writing is good writing. Uh, more writing makes you a better writer. The other thing it does with blogging uh, to Helmut's point was that it gives you more outlets for the things that you're interested in and the things you're an expert in uh, to be able to comment on, talk about, and have influence. And so um, if we only constrain ourselves essentially to publishing things in scientific papers, then we are already constrained to only talking to scientists right off the bat, number one. And so then, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you need to communicate to people who aren't scientists in a format that isn't a scientific journal, then you're already at a considerable disadvantage. Where I think if you're blogging and you're thinking about these things and you're getting the practice in, in what tends to be a very kind of uh, safe way to do that and risk-free way to do that, then I think you're kind of ahead of the game there. Um, there are other places where blogs come in very nicely. Uh, and so, for example, if you are like, for the, so there were two editorials that were published in, in large epidemiological journals, and both times, uh, or, or to each of those, I wrote a blog post kind of in response. And instead of sending that in as a letter to the editor of that journal, waiting for them to approve it or not, or reject it, or you know, print it or whatever, instead of wondering if the person's ever going to bother to read it or anything else, I, could, I just wrote the blog posts. And I just sent them to the people and everybody else. And I made sure it came to their attention. And then I can watch those people share that information with other people. And then there's obviously an immediate feedback loop there you know, that's not going to happen if I'm trying to publish these things in any kind of a traditional format. And of course, the trade-off is, well, maybe I've missed an opportunity to have a letter to the editor published in the journal. And that response is, I don't care. Right? And that might not be the right answer, but that's my answer. Um, so there's this kind of, it gives you these other venues, it's a lot of practice uh, in terms of writing and whatnot. Um, and it tends to go with Twitter very well. So once you start using Twitter, um, for most people, you don't have anybody following you, right? Because you just started. And so the real value in Twitter never really changes. For me, the number one thing about it, I think that should be of interest to people, even if they're not on it very often, is that it's a fantastic content aggregator, right? So we used to live in a world as scientists, I think, uh, this is what they tell me, uh, we used to live in a world as scientists where it was the role of journals and professional societies and conferences to serve as a filter for what things, as a signal, what things are important, what things do I need to read, what things should I be exposed to. And now we're at a point where we have so many scientists 
We have them publishing in so many places. There are so many societies. There are so many meetings that personally I find it overwhelming to think that I'm supposed to somehow stay on top of everything in my area of expertise, even if it's fairly narrowly defined. And then we have a lot of people, and such as myself, that work across a lot of different fields of expertise. You know, so for people who do mostly methodological work, they might one day be working on, you know, cardiac trial and the next day be doing something in elderly people, you know, one day public health, one day medicine. And so for someone like myself who engages in a lot of different areas and brings my expertise to those areas, hopefully, having something like Twitter to point out the things that are really important to me, or could be important to me, I find incredibly, incredibly valuable. And so it all comes down to how you shape the people you follow. And it's something that I've personally find is very kind of straightforward and easy to do. You know, you, you, it's easy. You tune out. You don't follow the people who are sharing nonsense you don't want to see. You do follow the people who are sharing things you like. And it's that simple. And in that way, and, and just as another example, so recently moving from where I was doing essentially working as a, what I would say is a statistical epidemiologist, uh, interested in kind of life course health and observational studies. Now I do a lot more stuff with clinical trials and clinical epidemiology. And so even though the methods are very similar, my expertise fits both, the being able to all of a sudden switch into the new field, well then I get onto Twitter, I follow a couple clinical trialists, I follow a couple statisticians who do trials, I follow people who do cardiology and the types of stuff that I'm becoming more involved in, and next thing I know, I've got the world-class experts, you know, pointing out things to me that I should find important. And so this has become, you know, there's kind of two aspects of that. So one, you have people who get onto Twitter and that's all they do. They just share stuff. They find stuff that's interesting and they share things with people. You know, and you find those accounts, it doesn't take long to find them because lots of people follow those people. The other thing that's changed a lot in the past, say, five years, is that now there are a lot of senior people on Twitter. All right, so in the world of epidemiology, now, in terms of people who are active on Twitter, engaging in conversations, uh, you know, who will interact with you, uh, Ken Rothman is on that list. Uh, he's written the greatest epidemiology book of all time, if you're an epidemiologist. Uh, Big Rothman, baby Rothman. Anyway, Ken Rothman's online. That's exciting. You're not excited, epidemiologists. Uh, George Davy Smith uh, is an active Twitter user. Uh, just, just people come to the top of my head. Deborah Lawler is on there. Um, all the major epidemiological societies are on there. Um, oh, who else? Um, Miguel Hernan is on there. He's very active. Uh, if you're like a cardiologist, now Daryl Francis is on there, and he tweets like a like a madman. Uh, all kinds of really interesting stuff. Um, I, I could go on and on. We could go through my list, and you could, you'd be kind of surprised if you haven't checked in on Twitter in a while. Exactly, kind of the the stratosphere of people that are on there, right? So you get these very high up people and you get these very kind of tuned in people trying to share things uh, and whatnot. Um, so that's kind of how it starts, is that you're just trying to find new information. But where it really starts to kind of take over, I think, in terms of a lot of the value, is that I think it really is a good community. Uh, once you are start to get plugged into people, once you find the people that you want to talk to, that it becomes about not just the sharing of this content, but now Twitter's, I think, again, over the last like maybe four or five years, is the quality of conversation happening on Twitter has really improved. And in my own experience, I've found that engaging with people um, is a lot easier. It's, it's very easy to draw these people into these conversations. And so you can find yourself you know, starting a question like, you know, do we think this trial should have done this this way? And you can walk away for an hour, and you can come back in, and you can find that seven world experts have chimed in with their opinions on this. And that happens in real time, and it's not at any other place you could ever do this. And one of the other things about it is that we get tied down in our schools and our departments and everything else, and I think sometimes it's very easy to forget that we are a part of bigger science, and that there are also wider conversations in science that don't happen in our schools and departments. So discussions around, you know, discussions around sexism, discussions around research integrity, uh, discussions around reproducibility, uh, all of these kind of things that are kind of big picture science things, there are conversations going on all the time with people from a bunch of different backgrounds and fields 
that happen on Twitter that we don't tend to sit down and talk about very often within our kind of local space. And so I think it's very useful in that way to feel kind of connected that there's a rest of the world out there in some respect. And it's true too, even within Ireland, in that I'll follow some people who are up in Galway, people up in Dublin, and it might not even people be people I know or I've met once or twice, but it's kind of like I don't, you know, I, I, my family is all far away, my friends are all pretty far away. I'm still on Facebook, I hate Facebook. I, I mean, I don't really use Facebook, but I won't turn it off because it's the only way really I can see, continue to see people's kids and you know, so to stay like connected because out of sight, out of mind. And so when you're on Twitter, you can see your colleagues who you maybe don't see, maybe you've never met, but you can see that they're active, they're out there, they're doing stuff. And it kind of just kind of, I think, keeps that community in the front of our mind. Um, so I'm kind of keeping an eye on the clock here. Again, interrupt at any time, but I will spiel on. Um, I think you're giving yeah. the wrong view. Sure, okay. <laughs> because I think you're far too sensible. Um, because obviously the way you're using it is absolutely amazing. But what if, what if there are some Twitter feeds talking about at the moment about this discussion about whether or not Ireland should have abortion? Sure. Uh, or in the UK, yeah. we, should we or should we not leave the EU? Yeah. Or do we or don't we like the President of the United States? Yeah. Because Twitter can sometimes absolutely entrench diametrically opposed views where common sense gets lost and people almost go into their tribes yeah and it, it, society can sometimes feel very stressed by this yeah so I mean I think like, like there's a macro picture and a micro picture so I think one thing is that you could do fairly well is and the easy way is to ignore that stuff yeah. so you know I do a little bit of offhand commenting about Brexit and about Trump uh, because sometimes you're just overwhelmed and you just have to say something. Um, but for the most part, I try to keep things on topic, for example. And so you would, you know, you, it's very easy to not follow people. And I have not followed people that do tend to talk about certain topics way more than they would talk about research or science or whatever. Uh, some of the filters on Twitter have gotten a little bit better at that. So in terms of my personal experience, I don't think it's that challenging to, again, to, to tweak and hone your Twitter feed so that you're not getting rapidly pulled off into this other nonsense. Uh, I think knowing that it's out there is another thing. Now, in terms of like big society and, you know, are these tools useful for that, I, you know, I couldn't, I don't have an intelligent thing to say about it. I totally take your point that it does seem to drive opinions one way or the other. And Twitter has a real problem. And in that, you know, is Twitter even going to be around in three or four years? Uh, and maybe Facebook too, I, you know, not going to disappear completely. Um, but I think people are get starting to get fed up with how those tools are being used by people who would uh, seek to uh, misinform uh, and, and misdirect and so on and so forth. So there is those kind of big picture issues. I don't have any doubt about that, but I'm, I'm comforted in the fact and thank you for if you, this sounds reasonable to you that I feel like my Twitter feed I'm surrounded by other reasonable people having real methodological discussions focused on science you know and all the rest of it um, so I find it very useful for that and in kind of that following on that community aspect of it um, I think we shouldn't undervalue like the social joy of it right like so uh, so again like when I was uh, before I was married uh, I actually did online dating once at a time when it would have been incredibly stigmatic to do online dating, which apparently now, like online dating, is just how you date, I think that's what happens. Um, but anyway, this idea that you could have real friendships online and relationships, you know, to me, like when I, you know, 15 years ago, would have been like, you know, that's a bit weird, right? Uh, but now I think it's very common to accept this. And so uh, I can honestly say that I have a lot of interactions uh, on Twitter that I just find socially enjoyable. And if we think about kind of our busy lives and, and everything else, it's very easy as a researcher to get kind of isolated, right? So I'm most happy, like sat at my laptop with my headphones on in a, in a, in a coffee shop somewhere with people leaving me alone. But at the same time, it's kind of nice to have these little social interactions. And even though they're people I've never met uh, and people I might never meet. Uh, so I think there's a real value to that as well. And in terms of kind of these kind of hedonic things and, and the pleasurable parts of it, um, there's something really fantastic that happens uh, 
which is when you've shared something uh, or an opinion or a paper or a piece of work you've done and then someone who you uh, as a scientist have admired for a long time comes in and says he's right or somebody should read this paper or this is well done. That is feedback we do not get as scientists in hardly any other venue that I can think of. And it's there on Twitter. And I think it's important that, you know, it, 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 that, that stuff matters. You know, that stuff uh, it certainly improves my day to have someone retweet my paper and say, look at this paper, this is a good paper. And that's someone who I've looked up to professionally. Like, you know, like I'm on cloud nine, right? So if you're asking me how productive I am, you know, I'm going to go off and write the next paper. Brent. Yeah, just along those lines, um, with the advent of um, preprints and by archive and all that, people are putting up their preprints now, and if yeah. they're following people in their field and people in the field are following them back, they're, they're, they're sending out the preprints, they're getting back feedback from it before it goes into print, and people are picking up on errors. I'm seeing that a lot now, actually. Yeah. Um, people are like reading through the papers and spotting things that maybe people should have addressed or missed or something. So um, it's very, very useful that way. Yeah, and it's amazing <coughs> to see, again, like the, uh, that people do engage. Like that you can, you, can, you can nudge somebody and say, hey, could you, do you mind having a look at this? And you see examples of, of, again, very senior people saying, yeah, sure. Or they tag in somebody else and maybe this person would be interested in that. Um, so I think that stuff is, yeah, it, it, it is very valuable. Uh, no doubt about that. Um, okay, so anybody else, any thoughts about things you've done on social media that you think are useful for you as a scientist per se? Anything I've missed? maybe events and, uh, and conferences. So for example, also a lot of like, workshops or events. Uh, yep. I only knew about these things on Twitter. Like yep. you follow one, for example, science communication, you follow one and they'll retweet others and then it's like, oh, there's another great thing. Yep. So That's a great example, because you can't look at every website that might have an event that you're interested in. You can't always count on your department or your colleagues you know, to, to share these things with you. But the stuff's all the time on Twitter. You're 100% right about that. Anyone else? I saw another. Yes, ma'am. Um, I mean, it's probably a generational thing, but um, I kind of get a knot in my chest thinking about social media. Sure. It just seems to be so overwhelming. Do you have sort of the three things that you do to kind of keep that, keep a lid on it? Yeah, fair enough. From the point of view of, of it basically not being too much. Yeah, I, I, think, I think they're kind of things like, again, I can, I've found myself, if I'm getting involved in a conver like a live conversation, then I find it very hard to put down at times. But in general, I try to just like I do with anything with terms of email, uh, in terms of uh, any kind of social networking at all online, is to pick times of the day to check in and try to be disciplined. So uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with smartphones. Uh, they're great. I don't have one. And that alone, I think, is very helpful because I'm not getting the, the note of, so you can set these things up. You can turn all this stuff off too. Uh, you know, it can be notifying you nonstop that if someone left you a message, someone said something, someone mentioned your name, blah, 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 blah. And that stuff's very hard to ignore. So I just don't have it, I think is one thing, you know. At the end of the day, I think part of it is knowing what tools there are uh, to kind of, again, to, to narrow the focus of your feed so you're not getting constantly bombarded and distracted. So you were doing your Twitter on your PC? Then? Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't have the phone. Um, so I've somehow managed to survive that, but again, I'm not uh, a Luddite or whatever. I, I think they're great. Uh, it just it just works better. I, you know, the real reason I don't have my phone is because I don't like texting with people, and so if people know that I have to sit there and go click 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 to text, and they don't text me, uh, so that's actually the real reason. Um, but I know that there's probably lots of stuff online. Like I would go on Twitter, and I would just like shoot out a question, <laughs> like, "Has anybody seen anything about how to kind of?" be careful that you're not using it too often. And I would sure we get 20 people probably sharing blog posts about that exact thing, you know. So, um, yeah, I think part of it is just a matter of personal discipline. Uh, but don't be scared. It's, uh, I, you know, it's, uh, for the most part, again, if you, if you are careful about who you follow, uh, most of it I tend to find very pleasant, where I wouldn't be standing up here blah, they're on about it for 45 minutes. Uh, almost exactly. Comments or questions? Yeah. Just one point. Um, I said, why just last year started um, to actually put uh, public engagement as one of the KPIs for evaluating projects. Hmm. Um, so um, 
this is actually something that uh, now even counts for uh, how your research team is evaluated and funded. Uh, whether that's a good thing? No, yeah, see, that's where I don't, yeah, argue about that. Uh, but, uh, um, definitely, it actually uh, is seen as an important yeah. uh, part. And obviously, it's uh, a way of also not just interacting with your peers, but also interacting with uh, um, the public. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I kind of hadn't mentioned the networking bit, which is one of the most obvious things as well, that you know, we all know that when it comes time to getting jobs, you know, having some kind of a public persona or information about you in the public is a good thing. Because it's not necessarily something that's gonna get you a job, but people when they're hiring tend to be risk averse. Right, so if I've got 10 unknowns in front of me, and I don't know anything about them except what's on their CV, and their CVs are all pretty, you know, similar or whatever. If I can see that there's a person online sharing what they know about, demonstrating excellence and expertise, like there's a lot of stuff that goes into papers. You don't know who did that stuff. Whereas if I wrote a blog post about this particular regression model, you know that I know what I'm talking about to some degree, <laughs> right? You can you can demonstrate these things. You can show that you're not a complete loon, and you know, then when people come to like, you know, investigating what job candidates are hiring, like they can look and they can say, look, I don't know if this person is going to be the next Einstein, but at least I know, you know, that she's not completely, you know, liable to come in and shoot everybody. You know, I, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I just think that's also a very useful aspect of it. And this engaging with the public in terms of blogging, I think, is a really critically important one. Um, we have, and this is a lot of the blogging stuff early on, is to fit this exact need. This, this, this interface between science and writing papers and essentially journalists and media reporting on that information and the stuff, the, all the stuff that falls out in the middle there, a lot of the very early science blogs were all about filling that gap. Like how do we communicate our own science to the public ourselves, you know, where we don't, aren't caring about the headline and the clickbait and the rest of it, but we can add more context and add more nuance uh, and put a kind of softer face on it in terms of communication while at the same time being honest to the message of it and all the rest of it. So, you know, if that kind of thing is, is what you're interested in, then, you know,